Welcome back students. In the last lecture I discussed all of the different software components required to set up a QGIS plugin development environment. In this lecture I want to get a little bit deeper into the weeds about what exactly a QGIS plugin is. The short answer of course is that a plugin is an extension that provides additional functionality to QGIS that is not included in the core package. But this definition is not very helpful in understanding how we create a QGIS plugin. Plugins can be developed in Python, as we'll be doing in this course, or C++. By far, the majority of user-contributed plugins are written in Python, as C++ development is orders of magnitude more complex than Python and far beyond the scope of this course. But you should know that it is an option. But some of the core QGIS plugins that were originally user contributed eventually become part of the core set of QGIS plugins, and some of them get rewritten in C to improve efficiency. Some plugins can be quite small, only a few lines of code, such as the latitude longitude calculator that will be our first example in this course. But plugins can also be very large and complex. For example, the semi-automatic classification plugin is about 20 megabytes in size and is virtually a complete program for analysis of remote sensing data from within QGIS. QGIS plugins run within the QGIS environment and allow interaction with the QGIS interface. For instance, you can allow the user to select a map layer that is part of the current QGIS project and perform some type of operation on that layer. You need to be running inside QGIS to be able to do this. QGIS plugins are also activated from the QGIS menu system or toolbar. They might also be a dockable window that can be docked to the QGIS interface, or a map tool that requires user interaction with the current map canvas. And QGIS also has a plugin manager that makes it very easy to find and install new plugins in a variety of ways. In every distribution, there is a plugins directory. In Windows, it's located at the following location, starting from the user's home directory. If you have custom user profiles set up, then you need to change the location from the default profile to get the plugin directory that is specific for that user profile. On Mac OS, the plugins directory is at this location. And the same caveat about custom profiles applies. When you start QGIS, the program checks this plugins directory and loads any plugin that it finds there. It's really that simple. You can also reload a plugin within a QGIS session by disabling it and then enabling it again. And we'll take advantage of this to streamline the development process. You can add new plugins to your QGIS environment in several ways. If you understand how the QGIS plugin system works, you can copy your plugin directly to the plugin directory. You could also remove the plugin by deleting it from the plugin directory. And we'll see how this is done in a few lectures down the road, as it's handy for development purposes. But most users will not want to do this, so there are better ways available. You can download a plugin as a zip file or send one of your plugins to someone else's as a zip file, and then use the option in the QGIS plugin manager to add a plugin from a zip file. And this is a quick way to distribute or add a custom plugin. By far the most common and preferred way to add a plugin, however, is to load them directly from a QGIS plugin repository. A repository is just a location on a web server that is accessible from the internet where plugins are stored uh, along with some metadata about the plugins. There is an official QGIS plugin repository that you are probably familiar with that is connected by default and this contains plugins that might be of general interest to all QGIS users. We'll see how we can submit our own plugins to this repository later on in this course. There are also other public QGIS repositories that you could add to your QGIS environment. You could also create your own repository that other people can access. 
A repository is simply an XML file containing some metadata about the plugins that are contained in it, including a link to the location of the plugin file on the web server, and we'll see how we do this later on. We'll create our own QGIS repository. And you might want to create your own repository for your organization if you end up developing a lot of custom plugins specific to your organization that would not be beneficial to people outside. Or if you have some other reason for not submitting your plugin to the official QGIS repository. Maybe you don't want to make your code available to others or commit to managing it as an open source project. The advantage to using repositories over distributing a zip file is that users can simply visit the repository and see what's available and install anything that they want without any interaction from the plugin developer. They also make it easy to view the plugin's metadata and see if updated versions are available, etc. Now let's get a little deeper into the weeds about what exactly a QGIS plugin is. I've already alluded to the fact that a plugin is a collection of many files that work together within QGIS to provide all the plugin functionality that we've discussed. So let's talk about what some of those files are. The metadata.txt file contains all the information about the plugin. And some of this is required if you want to submit it to the official QGIS repository. Other metadata is optional. But the QGIS plugin manager uses the information in this text file to populate the metadata it displays to the user. There will also be an icon file that is a 24 by 24 pixel image. And this is used as the image displayed in the toolbar and elsewhere within QGIS. The resources.qrc is a file that is part of the Qt resource system, which allows you to include binary resources such as images. It's basically an XML file containing some metadata about the resources. The resources.qrc file is used to create the resources.py file, which is a compiled version of the binary resources. This is basically a Python file containing binary data in text form that can be imported into your plugin like any other Python file, and eliminates the need to link to external files for images and other forms of binary data. The advantage is that you don't need to maintain an external file structure that could be modified by the user, which would cause your plugin to crash. The resources.qrc file is used to create the resources.py file, which is a compiled version of the binary resources. This is basically a Python file containing binary data in text form that can be imported to your plugin like any other Python file and eliminates the need to link to external files for images and other forms of binary data. The advantage is that you don't need to maintain an external file structure that could be modified by the user which would cause your plugin to crash. Every QGIS plugin is required to have a dunder init.py file that contains a single method named class factory that is essentially the constructor method for the plugin. The plugin.py file is the main plugin file containing the plugin class definition, some boilerplate code that adds menu items and toolbars to QGIS so that you can access the plugin, and it may also include some custom code that provide the core functionality for the plugin. Plugin dialog.py contains a dialog or a main window class that contains the user interface for the plugin, and this may also include some customization, including signals and slots associated with the user interface. Plugin.ui is a user interface file created by Qt Designer. So you create the user interface in Qt Designer and save it as a UI file. The plugin dialog.py file is Python code that imports the user interface and includes some custom modifications to the user interface if needed. And then the plugin.py file is Python code that calls the dialog from the QGIS menu and toolbar, and maybe also some custom code that provides our custom functionality. I should mention that these last three files probably won't actually be named plugin.py, plugin.dialog.py, and plugin.ui, but rather the plugin part will be replaced by the name of the plugin. 
And if all of this seems complicated, don't worry too much about it. We won't be creating all these files from scratch. We'll be using the Plugin Builder 3 plugin to generate all of these files, including some boilerplate code that we can then simply modify a bit to do something useful. And this is just the beginning. There may easily be multiple images required. There might be many Python files containing multiple dialogues or custom modules for large projects to help you organize your code. And there might be some other optional files and directories as well. In larger projects, there might be a help directory containing the setup files for the Sphinx automated documentation system. If you expect your plugin to have a worldwide audience, it can be internationalized so that its text is automatically translated to other languages. And those translation files will be in a directory called i18n. We won't be discussing unit tests in this course, but they're very important, especially for open source collaborative efforts, and many plugins will have some additional files containing the unit testing framework. You might also see a make file or a pb underscore tool dot cfg, which are two different methods for automating the build, package, and deploy process for a plugin. They both contain instructions to do that. And that can be very helpful, but you only need one of these, depending on your preference and operating system. And although they are technically optional, almost every plugin will contain at least one readme file and a license file as well. And again, all of these can be generated by the Plugin Builder 3 plugin, although with the exception of the readme and license files, we won't be just discussing them much further in this course. And finally, I wanted to discuss a few different types of plugins that we can create. Core plugins are those that the QGIS development team have deemed to be important enough that they are included by default with every QGIS distribution. These are mature plugins that have stood the test of time and proven to be useful to a wide variety of users. Core plugins are stored in a different location and thus cannot be uninstalled using the plugin manager but otherwise are not inherently different than regular plugins, although many of them are written in C++. Experimental plugins are those that are still in active development and may not have been thoroughly tested, but have been made available to the community to use in advance. You can flag your plugin as experimental and users will be able to make the choice for themselves if they want to take the risk or not. Risk-averse users may even choose to exclude experimental plugins from the list of available plugins that they see in the plugin manager. Most plugins were created by users to solve a specific problem and contributed to the official QGIS repository to make them available to other users who might also be facing a similar problem. There are many of these, and as you might expect, they vary widely in both complexity and quality. Some plugins just add menu items to the QGIS menu system and operate like any other menu item, usually opening a dialog to collect user input and then doing something based on that input. But a plugin could also be a map tool with do something based on user input on the map canvas rather than from input in a dialog. Examples include the zoom tools that center the map and zoom in or out in response to a user click, or the measure tool that will report the length of a line or the area of a polygon that the user draws on the screen with mouse clicks. The identify and selection tools are other examples. If you create a plugin that is based on a map tool, you'll need to use some specialized methods that allow you to interact with the map canvas. Another type of plugin is a processing plugin. These differ in that they follow a specific programming pattern that allow them to be used in the QGIS processing framework, which includes the processing toolbox, the graphical modeler, the results viewer, the processing history window, etc. It also allows the plugin to be accessed by any other software designed to work with the QGIS processing framework and can be designed so that the processing operation runs in the background in a separate thread that does not interfere with the main QGIS thread. So it doesn't block the program itself while the operation is crunching numbers. 
Plugins can be private, meaning that they are not accessible in any public repository and only available directly from the creator. This may be the case if a company develops its own set of plugins specific to its business logic that would not be useful for other companies. And finally, I wanted to make the point that plugins can be disabled and enabled by checking the box in the QGIS plugin manager. When a plugin is disabled, it's not uninstalled, meaning that the plugin remains in the plugin directory, but it is removed from memory. All of its menu items and toolbar buttons are removed, etc. So there is no evidence that it exists in the QGIS user interface until it is enabled by checking the box in Plugin Manager, at which point it is initialized again and will then be accessible to the user. And this is handy in that it means that we can disable and reload the plugin while we're developing it to see the effect of changes to the code without having to exit and reload QGIS. And we'll be doing this a lot throughout this course. So thanks a lot for listening. In the next lecture, we're going to roll up our sleeves and jump right in and create a very simple plugin so that we can see the entire process. And I think things will make a lot more sense at that point. And we'll see you then.